Hello. Uh, this is a presentation on a follow-up presentation on the results from the quiz on Module 2, uh, which was on external analysis. As you may recall from class, we there were 19 questions on the quiz, and there were four that I considered, you know, challenging or significant, you know, significantly challenging in the sense that um, less than 70% answered those correctly. Um, these were four questions that we covered in class uh, last week. Uh, questions three and four, question in, in the section on external analysis in general, question five under five force analysis, and question three under external analysis beyond the five forces. But I did point out to you that there were a number of questions, uh, actually five total, that between 70% and 80% answered correctly. So I call these the borderline questions, um, which I did not think it was worth going over in class, um, but since enough people might have questions about it, it was worth me recording this uh, presentation and discussing uh, those questions and the answers and you know you know why, what the right answer is and why. Um, so first, in the section of the quiz on external analysis in general, the one borderline question was question number five, um, and it was a true or false question. So true or false, the economics of an organization's external environment are exogenous or predetermined real realities which the organization should accept as given unchangeable constraints within which it must identify and pursue a successful strategic position. And so I've highlighted you know, some of the words here, exogenous, predetermined, unchangeable, right? Um, uh, you know, and, and over time, this question actually, I think the parentheticals I've added to the question to make it, you know, clearer because I think it used to just say, you know, exogenous realities which the organization should accept as given, um, but I added unchangeable or predetermined. But you should be get the impression from all of those words, exogenous, predetermined, given, unchangeable, um, that the idea is that the external environment is what it is, and you've got to accept it and figure out the best way to compete within it or to, to achieve a successful position within it. But it's not something that you can change. Well, quoting the reading, so the, 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 there were two um, required readings for this module. One of them was a, the article, The Five Competitive, Competitive Forces That Shape Strategy by Michael Porter, which was the Harvard Business Review article. And so quoting from that reading under, there's a section, you know, towards the end, a later part of the article, called Shaping Industry Structure. And it goes in great detail, but just to quote some highlights, companies also have the ability to shape industry structure. A, a firm can lead its industry toward new ways of competing that alter the five forces for the better. The starting point is to determine which forces or forces force or forces are currently constraining industry profitability and address them. A company can potentially influence all the competitive forces, right? So it's saying that uh, you can change the industry economics, you can shape industry structure, you can alter the five forces, you can influence all the forces. And the last bullet point here, just to, you can influence them for better or for worse, the last bullet point here says, there's a dark side to shaping industry structure that is equally important to understand. Ill-advised changes in competitive positioning and operating practices can undermine industry structure. Right. Um, I believe, for example, in class last week, uh, the topic of um, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and the idea that they were buying out each other's contracts um, might shape industry structure. Remember the whole idea of uh, having switching costs when there are switching costs helps to increase industry profitability when customers have switching costs and contracts for example, are a major switching cost, or the phone, the cost of the phone, are major switching costs in the in, in the mobile telephony business. And we talked about the potential that um, firms like T-Mobile and Verizon and uh, offering to buy out contracts and sort of no, I'm sorry, sorry, T-Mobile and Sprint offering to buy out contracts with the two leaders, AT&T and Verizon, and AT&T and AT Verizon therefore backing off on the contracts could end up lowering switching costs in that industry and actually make industry structure worse. And I use the example of the credit card industry, which is not as profitable as it used to be. Um, it used to be that you didn't couldn't transfer a balance. Once you, once you uh, had a balance on a credit card, you couldn't transfer it. Um, and therefore, you were stuck you know, paying off on whatever, and they could raise the interest rate on you, and you were stuck paying it off. 
um, with balance transfer became much more competitive, um, and it was it was a good move for those like Capital One to introduce balance transfer, but ultimately undermined industry structure. So again, but the point is, for better or for worse, is saying that you can alter industry structure. Also, um, just to, to point out where we actually went over it in class too, um, here's a slide, um, one of the slides on the fundamentals of external analysis. It's, and uh, I went through, of course, had a slide for, on, on identification, uh, in, information, incentives, and this, and this is interdependence and implications. And then in implications, notice how I have highlighted here, you know, how can a business manage or minimize the power, leverage, threat, or influence of external players? Or can a business shape industry structure to its advantage? Both of those, the idea being that how you can actually influence the external environment and not take it as given or unchangeable or exogenous, right? Um, here is, uh, you know, what, then, the, of course, the case study on the five forces that we did was Cola Wars. So here's one of the conclusion slides in the Cola Wars discussion about the general lessons from Cola Wars. Um, and the first bullet here you see is shaping industry structure. Coke and Pepsi created industry and created the industry and developed markets. It's a classic example of creating an excess market power. Industry structure is endogenous as well as exogenous, right? You can shape it. You, you know, you can't, don't have to take it as given. So then going back to the question now, it should be, obvious both from the reading and the lecture, the economics of organization and external environment are exogenous or predetermined realities which the organization should accept as given, unchangeable constraints within which it must identify and pursue a successful strategic tradition. No. They are not exogenous. They are they might be partially exogenous, but they're endogenous. They're not predetermined. You know, the barriers to entry uh, in the in the soft drink business, you know, things like economies of scale, um, things like access to shelf space, those were not exogenous economic barriers. There were barriers created by the Coke and Pepsi, and and these are not unchangeable constraints or realities. So, um, this is of course false. So, again, that's question five under external analysis in general. All right. So then, <coughs> moving to the next section um, on five force analysis in particular. Um, there, as you can see here, this is where we had the most only one you know question that you know fewer than seventy percent answer correctly. Question five, but there were four that fell into this borderline. You know, which is frankly the, what motivated me to, to record this um, lecture was the fact that you know if I you know if I only discuss question five I'm really you know certainly having four borderline questions on the topic of five force analysis made it worthwhile for me to actually you know uh, go over some more about five force analysis. So here was the question one, which was again a borderline question um, in terms of like I say between seventy and eighty percent of the, of the class got full credit on this one or got it correct. Um, is it true or false? If the members of an industry supplier group or supplier market possess a credible threat of forward integration into the focal industry, the industry you're analyzing, this tends to decrease the overall profitability of that focal industry. Okay. So again, we're analyzing an industry, a focal industry, the industry on which we are focusing. <laughs> um, so if that industry suppliers can forward integrate into our industry, how does that affect the industry's profitability? Right? If your suppliers could do what you're doing, replace you, um, compete with you, as opposed to just supplying you, how does that affect your profitability, the profitability of your industry? Well, let's look at, again, first going to the reading, um, the Porter reading on the five competitive forces of straight strategy. Here's just some excerpts from the power of suppliers. Powerful suppliers capture this section called the power of suppliers, one of the earlier sections in the, in the reading. Powerful suppliers capture more of the value for themselves by charging higher prices, limiting quality or services, or shifting costs to industry participants. A supplier group is powerful if the supplier group can credibly threaten to integrate forward into the industry. In that case, if industry participants make too much money relative to suppliers, they will induce suppliers to enter the market. But again, the idea being that, um, that Again, what do we mean by integration or forward integration or backward integration? Forward integration means being able to become your, do what your buyers do or become your own buyer, right? Backward integration would be become your own supplier. So if your suppliers could become their own buyers or be you, right? How does that affect uh, their power? Well, the answer is it affects their power because you've got to give them, you know, it, it puts a boundary on, you know, this is, it says here you can't make too much money. Right? If you don't give them a good deal, they'll do it themselves, right? Think about it this way. Think about it, you know, it's the idea of, you know, do you, do you clean your own, 
you know, a house or apartment, or do you hire someone to do it? Do you mow your own lawn or hire someone to do it? You know, um, the the idea again being, you know, um, uh, um, you know, on the other hand, do you do you buy your own buy vegetables or do you grow your own vegetables in a garden? The idea is that. It depends on how expensive it is to grow vegetables. If it gets really expensive to grow vegetables, then I will um, grow my own. Or if it gets real expensive to, you know, if, if having hiring someone to mow the lawn is, is too expensive, then I would mow it myself. In other words, the ability to do it for yourself increases your leverage. And so the fact that the supply, if your suppliers have a credible threat to throw, integrate forward, that increases their bargaining power. Right? Um, and so we also addressed that during the lectures. Here's a slide on the bargaining, one of the slides on the bargaining power of suppliers. We said under information, you know, do firms have the knowledge to backward integrate? Do suppliers have the knowledge to forward integrate? Right. So in other words, if, if you have the ability to backward integrate and um, <clears throat> and do what you're and become your own supplier, that increases your leverage. But if they have the knowledge and ability to forward integrate, then that increases their leverage. Um, and here, just again, this was a slide we talked about. Um, this is the diagram actually from Porter's book, Competitive Strategy, um, about the different aspects that affect each of the five forces. And you'll see, of course, under bargaining power of suppliers, the threat of forward integration relative to the threat of backward integration by firms in the industry. Um, and then I also, of course, repeated those things and, and, and more in how I documented how you know, it was covered, you know, that, that it ultimately breaks down into, for all the five forces, into these five eyes, identification, incentives, information, interdependence, and implications. Right, and there you see, of course, the supplier capability to forward integrate is, is, is a critical component of bargaining power suppliers. So the bottom line is, if the members of an industry supplier group you know, possess a credible threat of forward integration into the focal industry, what does that do? Well, it increases supplier power. It increases their bargaining power, their leverage. It reduces the, you know, um, you, they, they, uh, and be, when it increases supplier power, that means you have to pay them more. right? Um, and therefore, it's going to lower industry profitability. Um, and so, so again, anytime a whether it's your buyers have the ability to backward integrate, that increases buyer power. If your suppliers have have the, bar, the the ability to forward integrate, that increases supplier power. On the other hand, if you have the power to backward integrate, great, that just has the opposite effect. You've got leverage there, or forward integrate for your buyers, right? So, again, what this is going to do, again, if the members of an industry supplier group or supplier market possess a credible threat of forward integration, that is going to that is going to dec is indeed going to decrease the overall profit of that focal industry. So therefore, this is statement is in fact true. All right. The next borderline challenging question was question two. Again, a true or false. True or false, buyer power and supplier power are opposing external forces such that an industry subject to relatively high buyer power will consequently be subject to relatively low supplier power. Right? This is a, a miss this is a, a issue, let's say, without giving away the answer quite yet. This is an issue that um, a lot of, trips up a lot of students, and therefore I did, you know, make explicit note of emphasizing it in class a few times. Um, the idea of, you know, but but people say, well, if we have high supplier power, that means the suppliers are powerful, therefore the buyers are less powerful. Well, it means the buyers of your suppliers, which is you, um, right, or if you have high buyer power, then you're saying, okay, the buyers ha have high power. That means the suppliers to those buyers don't have as much power. Well, who are the suppliers to your buyers? That is you, right? Um, and your suppliers do not sell to your buyers, right? So you're, and in particular, I think it's, there's a number of places I could I could reference uh, in the readings or, or in this, but I think this captures it best. This this may remember this slide, which I've, reorganized and simplified a bit that I gave about bargaining power and value distribution. I said, look, it, you know, one extreme, we have the customer's willingness to pay and the supplier opportunity, supplier opportunity cost. And the division, who gets the value, whether it's the customer, or the suppliers, the firm, is dictated by price and cost. And one scenario is, for example, you could have low buyer power and high supplier power, right? In other words, you could have, in this case, the buyers um, have low bargaining power, therefore you are able to charge a price close to their willingness to pay. But your suppliers have high bargaining power, so therefore the cost that you're paying, is, which, which is what you pay the suppliers, is um, you know high relative to their opportunity cost, and therefore they're capturing more value. And you're you know you're able to capture as a firm between the price minus cost, of course, which is margin. Um, but uh, again, here's an example with low buyer power, high supplier power. 
I gave you this example of high buyer power or low supplier power. Again, where, where, your, where your buyers have high bargaining power, therefore they negotiate the price well below their willingness to pay, but you have low supplier power. So therefore, the cost um, that you pay to your suppliers is just above their supplier opportunity cost, just above the minimum they would possibly accept because they don't have a lot of bargain leverage. And if these were the only two scenarios, then that previous statement about them being mirroring forces, one's low, the other's high, would be true. But remember this, right? You can have high buyer power and high supplier power, right? That simply means that your buyers have high bargaining leverage, therefore they, they uh, uh, are able to, you know, leverage down, negotiate down, bargain down, compete down price, um, you know, well below their willingness to pay. Your supplier might have high bargaining power, therefore they're able to compete up the cost that you pay them um, well above their minimum they would accept their willingness to sell, their supply opportunity cost, and so leaving very little for the firm to capture. On the other hand, you could have low buyer power and low supplier power. Right. Um, in fact, that was an example. I mean, the cola wars. You know, the concentrate producers had relatively low um, low buyer power and low supplier power for I mean, the supplier to the concentrate producers and the buyers to the concentrate producers uh, had lo low bargaining power. So, therefore, in that case, you know, the price is uh, very close to the customer willingness to pay, um, and the cost is negotiated down close to the supplier opportunity cost, so neither your buyer nor your supplier are able to capture much value, and that leaves a high profit for the firms in the industry, because price minus cost is, is significant there, and that's why you get the happy face, right? But again, the point is, these are, these are you analyze these in the same way. The things that are dictating buyer and supplier power are very similar, but they are not you know, one does not determine the other. They're completely different transactions. You know, you negotiating your relationship with your suppliers really doesn't have anything to do with your relationship with your buyers. And you could have leverage in one relationship and not in the other, or vice versa, um, or in both, or in neither. Right. And so, this question: buyer power and supplier power are opposing external forces such that an industry subject to relatively high buyer power will consequently be subject to relatively low supplier power. No, that's that's not true. Right. Um, uh, it, it, it's possible. But that's one of only, you know, one of, you know, that high buyer power, low supply power is one of the four scenarios that we saw are described in the last um, slide. So, again, that question is false. Um, uh, again, it's something that a lot of people do stumble on. I think I've seen students, you know, this is why I emphasize it. And when I ask this question on the quiz, it gives me this extra chance to go over it now. All right, so question three. This is also something that's an interesting question, and, and we talked about this in, in class, and it's it's um, because it's a again a something that I think this is an issue that sometimes students struggle with. So true or false, strong brand loyalty among an, an industry's customer base generally increases the bargaining power of that industry's buyers. Right? Okay, brand loyalty does that make your buyers powerful or not powerful? Right? You might think. Well, I have very loyal customers. They're brand loyal customers, therefore they're they're good customers. That's the customers. Therefore they're powerful. Let's keep in mind. Do you want, from a profitability perspective, do you want powerful customers? The answer is no. You want them to have low power, low bargaining power, right? And so don't confuse being powerful with being some notion of good, right? The good kind of buyers. I mean, certainly we. Want, you want brand loyal customers, right? You want loyal customers. Is that, but um, is so? Is that make them powerful? It makes them the good good customers to have. But in fact, if their customers are good to have, that means they, by definition, are not powerful. And so let me go with just some of the stuff. Here's the from five competitive forces reading, right? It's just the idea of what what it means to have buyer power. So. Here's from the section on the power of buyers. Buyers are powerful if they have negotiating leverage relative to industry participants. A customer's group has negotiating leverage if the industry's products are standardized or undifferentiated. If buyers believe they can always find an equivalent product, they tend to play one vendor against another. A customer group also has negotiating leverage if buyers face few switching costs and changing vendors. Okay, so highlighting this, you know, the idea is leverage. So if products are standardized or undifferentiated, I don't care, you know, that means that. I'm, I'm indifferent whether I have one versus the other. That is the opposite of having brand loyalty. Brand loyalty means I'm going to buy my Coke. I'm going to buy my Pepsi. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm loyal to this brand. You know, I like this type of cigarettes. You know, I like this type of, the, the, you know, American made, you know, like General Motors, not Toyota, or even Ford, not Chevy, you know. So 
to, in that sense, having a brand and having brand loyalty is by definition a source of differentiation. And so, um, and what that means is that you don't consider the products equivalent. Right? Brand loyalty means that you don't consider the products equivalent. You're not going to play one against the other. You're not going to say because you because the truth is you're gonna you're gonna if you're highly brand loyal as a customer, you know you're gonna you're gonna buy. You're gonna be willing to pay a little extra for the product to which you are most loyal, right? And you're not going to say you're not going to play one against the other uh, as much as if you didn't care, right? Um, and and we talked about brand loyalty as being a switching cost. It's it, it's a it's a non-economic switching cost, right? Loyalty is a non-economic switching cost, right? It, it's economic switching cost would be something you have to actually. I mean, if you know, if I want to switch from Verizon to um, you know, AT and T. It might be the contract, what I owe on the phone, and these things are you know having to learn a new phone or whatever it might be. You know, these are economic switching costs. But if I just like AT and T better, right? I, my family was my dad worked for AT and T. I've got a strong connection. You know, whatever. If I like AT and T better, I'm brand loyal to AT and T. Maybe I just like their commercials. That is not an economic switching cost. That is not what I call a non-economic switching cost. We, in the very first day, you may remember. On Lester and Tilly's line, we talked about, you know, how does economic switching costs versus non-economic switching costs affect, you know, profitability? Um, because in that example, there were uh, relatively low economic switching costs for you to switch between Kronos lines and Lesser and Tilly's lines, but there was loyalty, brand loyalty. And there also was a practice of, of, of dual sourcing. So therefore, that created these non-economic switching costs. Um, but we talked about, you know, here, for example, you know, when I talk about the... the what influences the bargaining power of customers? Of course, it's buyer switching costs relative to firm switching costs, but also brand identity, right? Um, and here, again, different issues related to brand loyalty, um, the differentiation of the popular service, brand identity, pull through demand, you know, alternative sources available to the customers, customer versus firm switching costs, right? And finally, when we talked about ultimately why was it that, here's Nicola words, why was it that the concentrated producers have been so profitable for decades, if you know, almost a century? Um, you know, one of the big reasons was the heavy pull through demand, you know, from customers who had a strong brand identity for customers who have strong brand loyalty. And that actually, having strong brand loyalty means your customers are not likely to switch if you raise the price a little bit. And that makes them have low bargaining power, as we see here. So, strong brand loyalty among an industry's customer base generally increases the bargaining power of the industry's buyers. No, it's, in fact, by definition, um, to be brand loyal is to have less negotiating leverage because you will put up with a little bit of a higher price because to stick to the brand to which you're most loyal. So this question, answer this question is also false. All right, so then the last question, it was the last question in the section, but also the last question that was borderline was, was this question, this question nine. Uh, another one that, you know, like I say, it's not surprising. These are important. These aren't these aren't trick questions, right? Um, in fact, but they are difficult questions. Like you'll notice that I've highlighted in each of these cases, these are issues that are important but difficult to necessarily to understand. So if you got these wrong, you're 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 in good company, right? Um, but that said, it's not because I mean I certainly didn't make it in any way to trip you up, but it's something that you know is 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 a little bit harder to grasp on on first observation and so it's it's healthy to sort of have this opportunity to to make sure everybody understands it so here's the question nine it says which of the following scenarios is most attractive in terms of long-term industry profitability right high entry barriers and high exit barriers high entry barriers and low exit barriers low entry barriers and high exit barriers low entry barriers and low exit barriers right okay so basically saying what do you want if you were in an industry and you wanted to have high profitability uh, you know, presumably um what do you want do you want to have do you want your entry barriers, barriers to be high or low? Do you want your exit barriers to be high or low? Right? We really can separate it into that. It's two questions. You know, what's good for profitability? Right? What, what is most attractive in terms of long-term industry profitability? So do you want high entry barriers or low entry barriers? Do you want high exit barriers or low exit barriers? Now, I think most students, based on the answers, understood you know, the entry barriers question. So let's, talk, let's, let's address that. I think it's a little simpler question, I think. So here's under the threat of new entry from the five competitive forces reading. The threat of entry puts a cap on the profit potential of an industry. When the threat is high, incumbents must hold down their prices or boost investment to deter new competitors. The threat of entry in an industry depends on the height of entry barriers that are present and on the reaction entrants can expect from incumbents. If entry barriers are low and newcomers expect little retaliation from the entrenched competitors, the threat of entry is high and industry profitability is moderated, in other words, reduced or minimized or uh, not allowed to be high. So what is this, what it's saying is, again, the th I think you can understand the threat of entry 
<laughs> obviously by the name name threat, is not a good thing for profitability, right? New entrants compete away the profits, right? If you earn above normal profits, entrants will come. Um, and so the threat of new entry is not a good thing for profitability. Well, what makes the threat of entry high or low? Well, a number of things, but most importantly is do you have is entry barriers? If entry barriers are high, if it's difficult to enter, then then the threat of entry is low, and therefore profitability is high. If the entry barriers are low, the threat of entry is high, and therefore profitability is going to be low. So, I think most people understood that you certainly do not want to have low entry barriers, right? We can rule out C and D because low entry barriers um, um, make the threat of new entry high, which reduces profitability. So now the question is, is it A or B? So we know we want high entry barriers. Do we want high exit barriers or low exit barriers for profitability? Well. Again, going back to the reading, the five competitive forces reading, rivalry among, this is under the section of rivalry, the degree to which rivalry drives down an industry's profit potential depends first on the intensity with which companies compete and second on the basis in which they compete. Intensity of rivalry is greatest if exit barriers are high. Exit barriers, the flip side of entry barriers, arise because of such things as highly specialized assets or management's devotion to a particular business. These barriers keep companies in the market even though they may be earning low or negative returns. Excess capacity remains in use and the profitability of healthy competitors suffers as the sick ones hang on. So, in other words, right, remember that the idea is that if profits go up, what determines whether or not those are competed away is entry. If entry is easy, those profits will go away. If entry is difficult, those profits can be sustained. But what happens when profits go down? when profits are below normal or even losses occur. Well, how does an industry recover from that? Well, the answer is firms leave, right? Um, you know, if, pro if the profitability of business is, is, is the low, firms exit the business, right? And then profits get restored as, as supply shifts back, if you will, as there's less, as fewer companies in the market. But if exit barriers are high, firms that are even not doing so well stay in because it's hard for them to get out. They have, it talks about things like highly specialized assets. In other words, you can't, you've, you've got equipment you've invested in and you own, you can't use the factory that you can only use for this purpose. You've made some investments or, or you're particularly emotionally tied. It's a family business, you know. Um, restaurants often stay in business long, you know, not making a return that they could make if they just put the money in a stock market instead because they, you know, are very invested in that, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I, I've always sort of wondered about, you know, the, the idea of, investing in a, any sporting team as a investment as opposed to fun because a lot of owners of, fo of football teams or baseball teams, they just like the idea of being an owner. It's kind of cool to own a baseball team, whatever. And even if they're not making a lot of money, they'd stay in the business, right? They want to make money, of course. And so in some sense, that's you don't like um, competitors who are willing to stay in even if they don't um, make significant profit. So again, you want the exit barriers to be low so that firms will leave if profits, you know, go down, right? So what that means, here again, you know, on the, just so we went over it in class, you know, I talked about under interdependence and a rivalry, uh, you know, are there high barriers to exit the industry? What is the level of commitment to this industry among rivals? You know, high barriers to exit, high levels of commitment, those are things that are, can, you know, undermine profitability, increase rivalry, right? And so what we have then is that you, Again, so do you, you, we already said you want to have high entry barriers. Well, do you want to have high exit barriers or low exit barriers? Well, you don't want to have high exit barriers because if you do, that means that that you know profitability during the downtime down times, you know you're going to stay down. The down times are going to be longer. You know firms aren't going to exit. Um, but high entry barriers mean the up times endure because you don't have a lot of entry right away to certainly to compete with it. Low exit barriers are good because they mean that as profits go down, you know. Uh, firms get out right away. So the downtimes are short and the uptimes are, are longer, right? So again, it's the same logic, but it is obviously in reverse, right? Um, so you would, what's most attractive in terms of long-term industry profitability is high entry barriers and low exit barriers. All right. And so that's it. So, so in the last section, so that, that, those are the four borderline questions in the five force analysis section. In the last section on external analysis beyond the five forces, like there were none that were borderline. There's only one that was fewer than 70% and everything else, 80% or more answered correctly. So there's nothing to go over um, in that last section. Um, and so, again, between the discussion we had in class and this, we've pretty much covered, you know, we've covered half, more than, well, let's say nine of the 19 questions, you know, and certainly the, 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 the about all of the ones that presented any challenge uh, to a significant cross-section of the students. So, 
Hope that helps, and I will see you in class very soon.